First, here's the brief news from the world over this week. Derailed but not deterred by the upset election in Massachusetts, President Obama and congressional Democrats vowed this week to continue their push for health care reform. During the State of the Union address, the president repeated his demand of a year ago. Financial system, don't walk away from reform. Not now. Not when we are so close. Let us find a way to come together and finish the job for the American people. Let's get it done. Senate Democratic leader Harry Reid echoed the sentiment, pledging health care reform this year. One option still on the table is for the House to pass the Senate version approved before Scott Brown's election. Now, that move would allow the Senate to circumvent the 60-vote supermajority that they no longer have. In order to get House members to sign off on the Senate version, a separate bill would be voted on later, which would add fixes to the legislation. Remember, the Senate version of the bill is the one that funds abortion coverage. We'll let you know what is finally decided. And in a statement released this week, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops urged Congress to continue the push for health care reform. They decried the political and ideological conflicts of the past year, saying that the debate seems to have lost its central moral focus and policy priority to ensure that affordable, quality, life-giving care is available to all. Additionally, the conference reiterated its stand that genuine health care reform will protect the life, dignity, and consciences of all. Subsidiarity, a lone voice cried out this week. In an interview with LifeSite News, Bishop William Laurie of Bridgeport said that the bishop's support of health care access doesn't mean we, quote, favor the government taking over one-sixth of our economy. Elaborating, he said that any reform ought to avoid a centralization of power and that the shakeup in the Senate forcing congressional leadership to go back to the drawing board is a good thing. More about health care, Bishop Lurie's statement, and the recently discussed principle of subsidiarity later in the program. And a big victory for churches in the UK this week. In an overwhelming vote, the House of Lords rejected a government proposal in the so-called equality or equity bill. That would have required churches there to hire homosexuals or other people whose private conduct were inconsistent with church teachings. Legal experts argued that if passed, churches would have been in violation of the law if they refused to accept women practicing homosexuals or transsexuals as clergy. Further, it would have left the churches exposed to lawsuits if they did not allow priests or other religious from entering a same-sex union, living promiscuously, or even getting a sex change operation. And the Burqa Wars have returned to France. A parliamentary panel is recommending that Muslim women stop veiling their faces in public facilities, including hospitals and public transportation. They further recommended refusing residence cards and citizenship to anyone with visible signs of a radical religious practice. The nearly 200-page report contains a long list of measures intended to dissuade women from wearing burqas in France. However, there is no call to outlaw such garments in private areas and in the street. About five million Muslims live in France, more than any other country in Western Europe. Legislative action on the report is not likely to come before the country's regional elections in March. And Holocaust Remembrance Day was commemorated on Wednesday. The day marked the 65th anniversary of the liberation of concentra the concentration camp at Auschwitz. Among the dozens of ceremonies worldwide, elderly survivors bundled against the cold and snow returned to the yeah. gates of the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp to honor the million-plus Jews and others killed there by the Nazis. In Rome, Pope Benedict set aside part of his weekly general audience to remember the Shoah and what he called crimes of unheard of cruelty. The Holy Father pled that the memory of the Holocaust awaken an ever more convinced respect of the dignity of every person. 
And an Italian language biography of John Paul II was released this week in Rome. Headlines around the world have been oddly fixated on just one vignette from the book, mainly that the Holy Father practiced self-flagellation. Why He is a Saint was written by Monsignor Slavomir Odor, the postulator of John Paul's cause for canonization. The book also includes a number of previously unpublished speeches and documents by the Holy Father and tells of a secret plot to kidnap the Pope. For a full explanation of what the media missed, check out my blog at EWTN.com and we'll discuss this a little later in the show. And some sad news to report, American Catholic theologian and prolific author Ralph McInerney died this morning following a bout with cancer. He was 81. A professor of philosophy at the University of Notre Dame since 1955, Professor McInerney retired just this past summer. He'll probably best be remembered as the author of the Father Dowling Mysteries. The series was among his more than 80 novels, and also he wrote thousands of articles, both scholarly and otherwise, and scores of books on philosophy and church affairs. Viewers of this program in EWTN certainly remember Ralph. He and I did a mini-series based on his book, What Went Wrong with Vatican II, in the late 90s. We will remember him next week with a special encore interview we conducted a few years back. May Ralph McInerney rest in peace. Back in the U.S., atheists are going postal on the Postal Service. The Freedom From Religion Foundation is protesting the 2010 commemorative U.S. postage stamp honoring Mother Teresa of Calcutta. They say the honoring of a religious figure violates the separation of church and state. Somebody needs to inform the Freedom From Religion Foundation that that tired phrase does not appear in the Constitution, but in a letter of Thomas Jefferson to the Danbury Baptists. He was assuring them that there should be a separation of church and state and that their government would not trample on their free practice of religion. As Bill Donahue over at the Catholic League pointed out, the Freedom From Religion Foundation didn't have any problem with the post office commemorative stamps honoring the Reverend Martin Luther King or Nation of Islam leader Malcolm X. The post office says they were saluting Mother Teresa for her humanitarian work. Plans for a 30-second pro-life Super Bowl ad featuring Heisman Trophy winner Tim Tebow has drawn both detractors and defenders. Abortion rights groups are complaining to CBS that the ad is political advocacy and will divide viewers. However, according to reports, the spot simply chronicles Pam Tebow's decision not to abort Tim against the doctor's advice when she fell ill. Both are unapologetic, devout Christians. Throughout his celebrated career, Tebow spelled out scripture passages across those black no-glare smudges under his eyes. And Tebow is not the only athlete taking heat this week. An animal rights group, Friends of Animals, targeted U.S. Olympic skater Johnny Weir after he appeared at Nationals this week in a costume with a real fox pelt on his shoulder. Now, to my eye, the fox pelt was probably the least offensive part of this thing. Show people the costume. Somewhere, Adam Lambert is looking for his pajamas. In any event, Weir is bending to pressure and a good number of threatening emails from animal groups. He's agreed to wear a faux fox pelt on his costume during the Olympics in Vancouver. I'm too busy rooting for my saints to worry about any of this.